Got it. It's going to be a lot of that, lots of deep breathing. Yes. That's all we got. Deep breathing is good for you. Mm-hmm. Right? I'd like to think so. I've done absolutely. a lot of it. It helps me. It absolutely is, health-wise. Yeah. It's, it's like meditation, right? Like Pranayam. Yeah. Controlling the breath. Also detoxifying the internal organs. Pelvic breathing. You do the uh, alternate nostril ble- breathing yes. and stuff. Not yeah. showed, no. Yeah. Really balanced. Very helpful. Very helpful. <laughs> I'm very into meditation, too. It's cool. a big thing for me. It's a... Uh, Helps me quiet my mind. Oh, save Puts my everything life. where it needs to be. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Everything. Everything. It helps everything. Cool. I really, I really believe it. What do you think? I just, mm, I'm in a weird transitional spot where I'm wondering if we ever know if everything is accounted for, and if that's just a delusion of perfection itself. It's like everything. There's always going to be something floating in the air, and like, that's life. That's that's living that's being a human isn't that okay i've just no that's a great point you know just because i think lately i've been meditating and i don't get to this like same place um i have this like past idea of meditation like when i first started meditating that like how fucking full and beautiful i'd feel and it was great but like part of it was because you know i uh, disassociate into joy Mm. that was like a, a trauma habit that i had so I was able to like, it's like spiritual, um, what's the term? Awakening? No. Nah, well, like in, uh, uh, it's using spirituality, spiritual bypass, using spirituality to sort of like pretend that everything is 125 and it's like, right. it's not. And a whole point of like encompassing spirituality so that's why I asked everything. That's a good point. Just because I'm wondering that myself. If like if I need to, I can't account for everything. And I think the way I meant my answer is, mm-hmm. even when it's not okay, meditation helps you realize that's where you're at. You know. It's like that. Yes, it's acknowledgement. Gives space yeah. to find the peacefulness, regardless of what's actually right. happening. Right. Yes. I didn't do an intro, but that's fine. Okay. That's cool. I, I want to keep that because that was interesting. Cool. Uh, I did want to um, – there's a coincidence thing happened today because Love you that. put on Instagram just like an hour ago playing a cover that I really like that you play. Mm-hmm. And the reason I like that you – and I'm, I want you to tell me if I'm wrong here because I think sometimes – Sometimes a great way to use a cover is to introduce people to you with something they're already familiar with. And I feel like that song does that for you really well. Mm, thanks, dude. Does that... Does that, yeah. does that okay, well, I good. didn't ever think about it like that, but that actually gives me a lot of release. I got hired this year to um, play on a book tour with this older guy, Mark Berger. He's in his 70s. Just wrote his first book, released his first book. His wife is a composer um successful in her own right was like around in the bcbg area era rather of new york city that kind of punk rock og stuff so you know they're seasoned people they were hippies like the book he wrote is about like the stories of him being at woodstock so i get this email like in april last year and i like i had a dream i was going to get an email and this and mark's just saying like my wife and i found you on soundcloud hilarious because I stopped <laughs> uploading to SoundCloud like three or four years ago um, not intentionally just like sort of it was something I was doing and it fell off the oh, merry-go-round you know yeah I started doing something else so I they I had an, an, an Etta James cover on there I'd rather go blind and I was like damn I don't even I'm too scared to even re-listen to that because it was recorded so long ago that I don't even know what it sounds like like I would probably like cringe at some parts because that's how I am um, so in, in signing on to this project with, they were like, we want to hire you to sing at the book readings, to sing, to be like the grassroots folk person of the sixties, like take a song and like make it your own in your own right. Like Joe Cocker did with, with a little help for my friends and like all this stuff. And I was like, yeah, it sort of reignited and made me understand that like, that's how I knew I could songwrite because I could emulate a reflection of myself. Like you're saying, yeah through the filter of another song um and i don't think that until this year like i trusted the part of me that goes into grace slick land whatever it is 
that's like afraid to sort of be sound a little brash or a little mm -hmm. angry, you know? So when they asked me to cover that song, I was like, well, first of all, this is so easy, but I just also loved singing it. So yeah. Thanks for saying that. That really, I likes. should say I'm talking about feed your head. Yeah. With white rabbit. Yeah. Yeah. White rabbit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a great Jefferson airplane. It's yeah. a great song. Mm. Yeah. And I've, I heard you play it live the first time I heard you. Mm. Oh, really? Sing. Yeah. And I, and I just thought, what a great way to understand this person's music because I already have ideas about that song. Mm, mm -hmm. Okay, how about you guys introduce yourselves too? Because I like listening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna force you to be I part of this, it too. I yeah. know you're gonna ask me questions. Say. I'm gonna ask you questions. My name is Victoria. <laughs> Hello, Victoria. Hi, Victoria. Hey, Jimmy. Yeah. What do you do? Hey, Olivia. I'm a yoga teacher nice. in Albany. Oh, then that makes the whole pranayama thing. Uh, yeah, I was like, oh, are we just going to begin? Is this where we're starting? I find that <laughs> conversations really actually just happen that way. And mm -hmm. when you try to plan it, you end up with this fake thing where people are trying to say something. Make it you know, cool. You what, know what I mean? What's the message? Yeah, dude. Here's something I thought once about mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. We were at Zan and the Winter Folks uh, CD release thing at, at uh, Little Pex. Mm. And you were really feeling the music yeah. in, in the moment. Yeah. And you and it, it like took over your whole body mm. and i've seen you do that a lot and i'm, mm. I'm envious of it because i don't mm. i feel like if i have that capacity i limit myself yeah there very much and then my thought was i i struggle with the word i want to say you're like a highly sensitive person and i don't mean that like you can't oh. take things i mean right. it like you're very sensitive to what the energy of the room is or what's going on. High receptivity. Yes. And that, if you're talking about meditation, is what you're trying to get to, maintaining equanimity and being as receptive as possible. Yeah. Yes. My, I have a question, though. Yeah. What is that like? Because you're an artist, and yeah. I know that for artists, you definitely have periods of, like, sudden lots of creativity mm -hmm. or periods of a void, maybe, or depression. Mm -hmm. Does it, how does it hit you? Especially the ones where you're over, where there's just tons of stuff coming at you. So, um, there's a lot of different things happening there. Uh, one of them is that I was incredibly traumatized at a young age to a point where like, if I didn't find some other way to absolve my energy into something else, to be a channel for something else, um, I don't think that I'd be here on this earth because it's been ultimately painful now that I'm an adult I can sort of or not like an adult but have gotten to a higher receptivity point you know which I believed was through meditating and that kind of focus um I used to get that through song and then that kind of leveled off for me so then like I went into meditating and then that leveled off for me because I remembered all this crazy stuff so I really think about like you know your subconscious as like an earth with a core mm. and like yeah like there's no reason to stay at the core there's lots of other stuff happening in all the other layers, but it is, there are layers like that. And it's taken a shit long time to consciously unpack all of that trauma now that I remember it. But what I'm understanding is that um, music and dancing and being inside that is like, it's more me than like my body is, which is honestly a very painful thing to, uh, even talk about and realize because I've had to I, it's escapism some of it is escapism so there's that part but then there's the other part where it's like it's me mm. that's just me that's I've been doing that since I was a kid as self-soothing but also you know I'm I'm being very very critical of myself like it's not it is me mm -hmm. it is me it's just like so much bigger than what most humans trust but I had to trust it in myself at such a young age that um, I find it makes a lot of people uncomfortable. So that's what it's like. It's like being able to be yourself and feeling every single person's ill reaction in the room, learning to not be attuned to that, having days where you cannot, and I'm going to cry. So, you know, just today has <laughs> been like, fine. yeah, oh, which I love. Yeah, thank you um, for the space. But it's like the there are some days where, like, I can't, I don't have control whether, like, I'm going to feel all of that or not. And it's just better off to not be, but then it's like, I can't not be in society. So yeah, part of it is like really beautiful. All of it is actually really beautiful and wholesome for me. And I love being that receptive. 
Um, but it's it's all about understanding the channel and uh, the things that were caught in it and why I brush sometimes. But yeah, there's like definitely a mental effectness that I have a mental illness perhaps in some cases where like some of it's hereditary some of it's based on my brain trying to grow around that trauma um but yeah like I am most empowered me and I also feel like highest me when I'm playing music Mm. um I like how you're talking about it because I'm a big believer in balance so mm -hmm. Any huge strength to me is also a great weakness. It's just the yeah, way it is. Right. You it's like, yeah. you know what your passion is, is such a consuming responsibility right. that like to not do it to your highest every day feels like a tragedy, but it's not. It really does. It's not a tragedy. Oh, because, it really like, does though. That's what imagine I'm going doing. through the whole world, never knowing what that passion is and being like, yeah, this is just life. Mm-hmm. And you never get to feel that aesthetic channel where you're like you're really embodied by that that zhuzh, that feeling that yeah. we all are trying to get to. I mean, you know, it's Crazy. funny that you say that though, Victoria, because I've uh, and this helps me flip that too. The same way you said something earlier, Jimmy, that helped me flip something. It's like, great. No, yeah, love me. It's fine. <laughs> this is a form of love. We're helping. Um, everybody's doing great. We um, want to hear you. That's, yeah. that, that's thank that. you. We want to hear you. I want to be heard. Yeah. So, um, it's like. People used to say that to me all the time. You're so lucky to know what your passion is. Mm. You're so lucky to have that figured out already. You're so lucky to like already be. And because I had all this hidden trauma that I didn't actually consciously remember, I had this huge like ember burning of resentment for like, fuck anybody that thinks this is easy. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. It's a terrible burden to love. (laughs) That's what you do. Yeah. It's, It's almost like it's, I get it. I've been at a similar level because when you when you get to a certain point in anything, mm. the people who are way I don't want to use I don't want to like use a word that sounds like I'm looking down on anybody, but when they can tell that you've achieved something, mm. it's like they're in kindergarten and you've graduated from college. Right. You know, and yeah. it, and it's like from their perspective, look at all you're done. You did all the work. You're all done. Mm. But, right. But the real is, is no. Now I'm in the real world. Yeah. Just started. And I, there's a part of me that That's really it. wishes that I was still in kindergarten because then I wouldn't have to deal with this and we'd still have nap time. I you want know? nap time so badly. <laughs> well, and it's like in, in understanding your own power eventually, you'd like to hope that you can curate a life as an adult where you get to create your own nap time. Mm. But what you're saying is also true. Katie Cusack and I, someone who you've had at this desk before, like... We talked today, and I said to her, like, I was just like, yeah, I don't get to fall back asleep. Yeah. I'm awake to these things in yes. the world. In the same way that we talk about people of color, people who are marginalized, people in, in the queer community, where it's like, they don't get to unsee what they've seen. Mm-hmm. It's not like you get to be like, oh, yeah, I'm gay, and that's, like, super crazy, and, like, not a lot of people like me, but, like, you know, it's all good. No. <laughs> now you know forever that, like, this is not good, and it's... It's maybe part of your purpose, maybe not, but it's it can't be unseen, right. and it's difficult to to see a lot, I think. But it's also a gift, like you're saying. Yeah, so. it is. I had uh, this analogy I used for myself, which was like, at some point in my life, I realized that I wasn't the driver of the car. I was like this silent navigator. First, I was aware of the silent navigator, who's just there, who's telling you, you should turn left here. Mm-hmm. You should turn left here doesn't care if you don't do it it's like well now this is gonna happen yeah but like and then you realize oh that's me that's <laughs> that's the true me right yes and then and but the the pain of that is you can't be that way all the time like sometimes you are completely identified with the driver you know what i mean that's like a safety mechanism though if you think about it yep. the part of you that creates your ego and your story yeah. your narr- narrative and that's attached to your job and your possessions you need that to move through world like we're not yes. renunciates we're not living on a mountain we right. have jobs you have shit to do i always understood is that you can let that person speak you ha- someone has to drive the car mm-hmm. but you don't want them to hold the steering wheel so the navigator need like they have to have their hand on there with you. like That's true. Whatever's connected back again to that feeling, to the passion, to the channel, to that opening, that rushing. That person needs to like really hold on tight to the steering wheel. Yeah. Do, do you ever have those <laughs> moments where you look at the world and you see all these people who are driving blindly and they're yes. like completely disconnected from the navigator? I was just talking about that. People who 
have no impetus to explore ambiguity and are just like this is how it is people who never find their passion mm. who wake up every day and they're like this is life yeah i'm just yeah i'm so happy my life is so it's great and that's just their whole life that's fine for yeah. them it's hard to push people to be more open when they're not ready like almost more painful it's not everyone's job but i think in small ways when we display passion or chase what we love it's an example it's like an invitation it's a mirror back to those people to yeah. be like hey like just hey like it could be like this i completely agree it could be it, like this you get more people figuring that out by driving well you know mm. when you're driving well yes. and people see you all the success that you have yes. they'll they'll be like eventually you can't force them to figure it out and i'm talking mm. like i know everything <laughs> but i don't well, me neither. and and i'm like i'm another one who's not completely figured it out i'm yeah I hold myself accountable to this as well, mm. but uh, you you can't. I don't think you can figure it out until until you decide what is it that I could do differently instead mm. of instead of like how come that person you know like you know what I mean yes. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My, oh, yeah. But uh, what I was gonna say is sometimes I feel completely separated from that navigator, and because I'm I know that navigator exists. It's more painful. It's like mm. I can't enjoy those moments the way I did. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, that's a true fact. Total. Well, that goes back yeah. to like what you said about perfectionism, right? Mm -hmm. I've been thinking about The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. Yeah. I Excellent. haven't read that. I have to read that. That's right. The four points are like uh, be impeccable with your word. Don't make assumptions. Don't take anything personally. Always do your best. T my 20s were like don't take anything personally. Big deal. That was a big deal. But I'm, I've been focusing more on always do your best. And it's not do everything right or do everything perfect. Right. But like me laying and watching Netflix for six hours, I'm like, oh, I'm terrible. I'm not practicing. I'm not meditating. But it's like, Russ, that was my best today. Yeah. <laughs> that was my best today. <laughs> you ever look back on those times where it was difficult, but you knew you were doing your best? Mm -hmm. And then compare it to where it's not so hard anymore, but you know you're not doing your best? Yes. It feels so much better when you're doing your best and failing than it does to be getting by doing not Successful. your best. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have Whoa. a lot to say about that. Yeah, well, <laughs> open it up. So <laughs> I'm. it's like when I remember this trauma, I accessed a whole other person that's had to like – if I was an outline of a body, it's basically like most of the whole body that wasn't there. And I know her. She's been projected at me my whole life. But now that I've integrated that, I'm, I've been in this, oh, this very tricky period where if I'm being completely honest, like, you know, there will be times where I feel that contrast that you're talking about, like, oh man. And you know, cause I've been having flashbacks like every day for three years and that's just what it is, which is epically horrible. I spent a majority of my early 20s to my mid-20s working my ass off, working way more than I should have pushed my body to do, but also finding like ways like meditation, like changing my diet to like make my body high efficiency for that. And then when I hit this trauma, it was like, oh, this is a whole other thing. This is like, you're a whole other person now. So I'm in this period now where I'm, I feel free of so many of those things, but if I push too hard, it's dangerous. Like I pass out. Mm. Like it's, it's just like, I really can't fuck with it. And so the only way to actually know if that contrast is there and that I'm not like illuminating something more than necessarily is to go so slow. And that is the worst <laughs> yeah. because it's because every time i check in with it it's like no nope, even slower and even slower even slower and that's what i realized meditation is is like for me or what i'm attaining with it is that like yeah i've had extreme moments of enlightenment extreme joy extreme transmission of things i think through creating that opening but the more that it's helping me do is just get closer to stillness and stillness is scary yeah, it is. because it's just mm -hmm. not even that. You know what I mean? So as you approach it more, you're just like, I can't believe I'm just, yeah. it, it's weird. Mm -hmm. It's weird. So I'm, I'm getting to this point where like, I just, the only thing that I can put out there is, and being impeccable with my word by being my best is like going so slow that like the things are right there 
they're easy to grab because my whole life I've been reaching through that wall into the next door neighbor's yard and that's been normal and that's just like not fair to no. anything inside of me that's just going to keep catapulting me into trauma so I, so I sort of like am retraining myself emotionally like someone who'd be epically debilitated in like a hospital where it's like okay and physical therapy and all we can do is just squeeze this a little bit and oh. that's a perfect analogy yeah and you can't go any faster than right and but I, it's like unseen so it's it's hard it's it's not a you know it's an it's an invisible disability yeah and and because i can perform so well alongside having that disability it's fucking i've been very angry about it which i'm now finally letting myself have and i'm i'm letting go of so much anger because i'm like right it's totally reasonable that you're angry yeah. about this <laughs> you know the stages of uh what is it loss yeah anger is one of them mm. yes I think that's what it usually is. It's it's like I don't want to lose this. Oh damn it! I lost a family I'm member like, yesterday, so uh, it's like they're just really. I'm sorry. Thanks. It's all good. It's just like yeah, that's been a consistent theme in my life, and I'm sorry. I don't even mean to no, cut you off. You're okay. It's just like yeah, I'm like. It would probably be a good practice, I'd like to say for all of us, but I'm just talking about me really. Is to like, try to separate how many different losses I'm grieving. Mm -hmm. Or I've been grieving, mm. you know, <laughs> yeah, <Yes, girl. laughs> because I think a lot of us are like putting all of that grief into this one channel. And I, I have experienced that with like close friends of mine and talking like we even got into some of that, like the first time we had a conversation that it's like, you're just so used to the grief from childhood that it's also going in the same place as the grief from the last ex and the, and the grief from just like being a white person. And, you know, it's just like anything like, you know, and it's like, no, I, okay, I'm grieving the loss of my ego in this way. That's a death. And yeah, I'm thinking about this exercise. It's this ritual. So I've, I've channeled my spiritual practice because of the high sensitivity that I have. I do readings and stuff for people. They were way too involved in all the years I've done them way too involved. Like I was just like giving people the insides of their brains. And it's like, uh, again, like reaching through the wall over there, not mm -hmm. necessary. And so I've been told in my meditating that like, yep, Life is just going to keep going now. You're not going to feel great all the time. And sometimes you're going to be working through those feelings while also doing this work. Mm. It's like, huh, hmm, right. That's life. I'm a hum in my human body now. But understanding too that like um, I can just write an email to people and still use that skill and channel what they need to hear and specifically with a ritual. Mm. And one that I've been thinking about pitching to Instagram or just like really hashing out in a writing way is like, can you write out? what process you're in with each death that you're dealing with because you are dealing with multiple deaths whether or not you want to believe it everybody is yeah hmm. i think that's why that stillness is so scary mm -hmm. because you realize how not still you are and you're all and you you have nothing to project it onto like mm -hmm. you have nothing to be like it's this person or it's this thing or it's because i'm not doing this it's like no 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 <laughs> it's all you <laughs> you've created all of that inside yourself you're not still the world isn't still. Finding stillness is terrifying because you have to do it completely alone. In, mm. a, in a way, like you're alone yeah. with yourself mm. and all of this stuff that you just create in your head. Have you ever done like a sensory deprivation tank or anything like that? I want to. I feel like I would really like it. So my experience, again, terrified. I was like 60 minutes, just me mm. inside of my head. It's going to be absurd. And like got in 15 minutes of just like discomfort water's comfortable i'm like totally in it but just like having to move and settle and then after that it it, it ended so there's like 45 minutes where it's just lost time where i was like oh that's relaxing yeah just like taking that break acknowledging the discomfort of confronting yourself and like moving it around until you don't have to anymore that's why it's not really relaxing to to like lay in bed and go to mm. sleep you know like mm. That doesn't really solve any of the problem. It solves your physical body's need for sleep, mm. but it doesn't. To me, it doesn't really. It's not it doesn't help you relax in any other way. Huh. You know what I mean? I, I personally I, love sleeping. So. I do, too. but do you, do you know what I mean? Like, yes, yeah, it's, like yes. you can go if you're in a, a reasonably good mental state and yeah. you go to sleep, you'll wake up feeling refreshed. Mm. But if you are a mess, you could sleep all day, Still and you'll never feel awake. Yes. Story of my life. Didn't yeah. start feeling rested until I started meditating. Mm. And I started meditating when I was 23, mm. 24. Yeah. So And it's like 
what would happen when I'd meditate. And I tell people this, please follow through. If anybody's watching this, please follow through on this one thing. If when you begin meditating, carve out big sections of time. Because if you fall asleep, you need that sleep. Yeah, that's true. You're getting it in a place that you haven't been able to get that rest. Mm. And in the first two years of me meditating, I would just fall asleep for an hour to five hours. And I would let it happen. And like, I don't think I could have recovered any or been able to work through any of this trauma if I hadn't let my brain do that. Mm. My brain wouldn't have been relaxed enough to even be able to show me that stuff and have me feel safe enough, which is a good indicator of how far I've come. Yay me, you know, but like rock and roll, (laughs) but it's like, yeah, no, if you, right. There's two things with people who are critical of meditation that I hear the most and it frustrates me because that's, this is me not being able to let them be where they are. But I, I like, I can't stand when people say, well, it's just, it's easy. I don't don't understand. And I'm like, then you're not doing it. You know, (laughs) you know, if, if it's easy, you're not doing it. You're thinking a lot. Probably you're like thinking about, well, I can do this later and I can do this later. You know, if it's not hard, you don't know you haven't done it yet. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, the other thing is people saying, I just can't do it. And it's like, yes, you can. You can do it for one minute. Probably maybe tomorrow you could do for two minutes. Mm -hmm. There's no one who said that you have to be able to sit down for an hour and be able to just be silent for an hour. No, you are where you Mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. Don't say you can't do it. Don't say it's easy. Neither of those things are true. That those two things just there can be really easy bug days. Me. There can yeah. be joyful oh, yes. meditative days, but then there will be days where like I I was thinking the whole time, it was just like that passing thought. My favorite thing about people meditating, they're like, I can't sit on the floor, and I was like, oh cool, why? Okay, don't sit then, in a chair. Don't <laughs> like lay down. I don't know. Yeah, do whatever you need to do. Yeah. It's yours. Find a comfortable position for your body. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> that's where you start. Well, that's very American, right? To be like, oh, no, I can't conform to it. And it's like, well, no, med- the whole point of meditation is that. Personal you- practice. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that's kind of lost in the society a little, right? Like, and the, I mean, I think that's why Instagram is so huge, especially with influencer culture and everything is like, what it's really, if we go back to the roots of humanity and tribalism, so much of what kept us together and kept us connected to each other and the earth and our, to our own souls, spirits, hearts, and human bodies was practice, mm. individual practice, group practice, community practice. And now it's like, because of consumerism, you watch so many people who project some sort of sense of effortless, forever, perfect self-care self-practice and it's like that's impossible it's not true it's not true exactly it's not true it's it's the same as like us thinking that every single woman is supposed to be like you know 36 24 36 or whatever the fuck it is like it's just like it's all dumb it's like it so it's just wild because like humans clearly want that well what we want is community care yeah and then you know when we talk about like societal failings, we then remarket being healthy and feeling good into self care. And it's like, no, actually, you took the library out of my town. Actually, my kid goes to a school that's filled with mold. Like, that's nuts. Oh. No amount of self care will fix that shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can meditate all day. My, yeah. my kid's going to have lead poisoning and will have mental disabilities that will affect me financially. For the rest of my life. Yeah. Like, oh, let me get a, ma- a mask. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, you know, we'll, just, <laughs> we'll just meditate on that until yeah. it goes away. Yeah. Well, like, thoughts and prayers. <laughs> 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 Do you know what I mean? Like, but, and that's, but that's the whole thing. It's like, right. it's, it's so wild that we live in this dystopian reality through the internet and through media where like, we can say thoughts and prayers and people really take to that and no, but know it's bullshit. And then we can have somebody else being like, this is how I'm flawless. And everybody's like, oh my God, love her. And it's like, but that's the same thing as thoughts and prayers. What the fuck? So I was a big, because I'm a software engineer. So for mm. a long time, I was always saying, me and a friend of mine have talked about social media. And he got rid of all of it like five years ago. And uh, so we talked about if, whether it was good or bad. And I always said, for the longest time, I said, it, it's, it would be good if we knew how to use it right. We just haven't figured it out yet. But now I'm at the state where I'm like, I don't know that we can mm. figure out how to use it like healthy not the way we are Mm -hmm. and did you see katie cusack tweeted something the other day about somebody on wmht talking about live music is dead and we talked about that a lot today um i don't have conflicting things but i it hit a lot of nodes for me because that person that she referenced is uh someone 
who I just did a gig with. And um, we talked about a lot of that. And we were actually at Superior and um, one of the baristas, the, the roaster there, I don't think he'd mind me shouting it out. Matthew was talking with us and like, he was just like, you know, this is at this speed, the way you're talking about it, this is going to have to die. <laughs> like, it's like that though. It's going to have to hit the freaking camera lens or the wall. Like, this is a, this is going to crash land. It's going at way too high of a speed, at way too quick of a speed. Like, this is new, yeah. this whole obsession thing. And it's going to break in our psyches. And it's going to be something, like, in 10 years in humanity, and I know I'm right. <laughs> speak, it into, speak it into existence, y'all. But it's like, I know I'm right. It's like, we're going to have many, many different delicate programs and not so delicate and different things set up so that people know how – to have boundary with lifestyle. It did it did unveil something in myself because I realized that I didn't care if people responded to me. I didn't get upset if people didn't respond to me, but I felt like I was doing something wrong if I didn't respond. Like I thought I'm going to hurt this person's feeling or do something wrong if I don't respond immediately. Yes. And it's weird how I extended the respect of of space to everybody but myself. Yes. Mhm. That's something I st- I struggle with all the time it's like i'll get back to you right away god forbid you feel anxiety or rejection because of this piece of plastic and right. metal which now i swipe them away if i see a notification <laughs> like i i mm. almost without even thinking swipe them away mm. because my thought was just if if just because you know i have my phone you know i have my phone doesn't give you 100 percent access to me whenever you want and if you are a person who wants me to feel that way i don't want you in my life Mm -hmm. and i don't need that energy so i'm not going to feed it by responding to it and every then it it ends up with people who are who don't care the same the same respect i'm I'm extending to them i don't care if you respond to me immediately or ever you know yeah if someone has an agenda like that it's like you really don't have much of a life do you (laughs) If you're waiting on my one text message yeah. and we're not that close, then like it, this is an indicator that like I shouldn't get closer to you because you're just gonna suck you try to suck you with some of my shit. Right. If you need the attention from me so badly, I'm like, don't know what happened to you in your youth, but like, <laughs> no red flag, red flag, like just not a yeah. It's you know it's funny is like when you both said that like your tendency is to like even respond to people, not give yourself the space in that time and like make sure that the people that are reaching out to you. (sighs) I've been on the opposite end of that since I started dealing with this trauma specifically and a little before then. I mean, I guess I've always been dealing with it, right? But consciously and like the remembering was just like kind of this idea of like, oh no, nobody gets to feel that way about me. And like (laughs) already putting this expectation out. I kind of did that when I moved to Texas, you know, like, I didn't tell anybody where I was going. And it was the first time that I did something anonymously. And I realized that, like, living is anonymous. That's true. Yeah. Living is anonymous. And this whole idea that we're being watched is is what creates this crazy anxiety and this need to check and mm. recheck and create content. And cre- it's like, yo, oh. content is created by yourself, with yourself. And, Oof, and I lived sense. that. I, I quit Instagram for almost a full month. I gained so much of my clarity back after remembering and moving to Austin was like allowing this dive bomb of media and friendship and fake friendship culture and drinking and drugs and just like on all the time, on good all the mm. time, on all the time. All self care is glamorous all the time. Well, but it just it fucked me up. And I got good there. I was already so depressed, but I like I learned there too that it was like, man, I really can't let people in the way that I have been. And so I've sort of been like austere. And even since coming home, I used to be like, man, is this a problem? But like I moved back here in July of 2018 and in November of 2018, people were like, so did you just move back? And I was like, that's great. (laughs) It's important to be discerning with one's energy. (laughs) Well, and it's great that you don't know that I'm here. And it's great that like, you don't need to know very because no, but, well, because and that's where autonomy comes from, and like mm. codependency, especially, is built in this idea that like your energy moves another person's, or that it's supposed to be responsible. Like like you're saying, like you've attached to me, you've messaged me, so now I must do something about it. And I've just been like, uh, you're trying to become a scab, and you're not part of my skin. <laughs> Bye. Yes. See you later. Move along now, um, as my dad would say. <laughs> uh, move along now. 
Because it's like, yeah, it's just... I love you so much. I love you so much, too. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm really glad that we did this together. <laughs> I'm glad, too. Because, well, Victoria and I have... Victoria's just been so instrumental in my life in the past six months of, like, being able to hold space for true conversation. And, like, I know that I can say my whole truth. And while, like, Victoria and the whole scan and the listening to it might be like, oh, damn, like, Olivia's got some shit. She's not going to, like, judge me. Hmm. Which is, like, you know... Kind of the friends you got to have if you're going to be on this level with yourself, right? Mm-hmm. We're just talking about friendship, how it's like such a a good, authentic friendship. Very good mirror. It's an invitation to look at yourself in a low stakes way. Relationships, romantic relationships are do that too, but everything feels so intense. Mm-hmm. But friendships are just like, yes, I That's can love so and support true. you and just we can just like move through this. That is so true. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah love Olivia. Really helped me out. <laughs> you yeah. already know. You already yeah, know. but but same. Like I feel like we hit each other at a similar point. How'd you guys meet? Well, we've known each other for a long time. Yeah, like five or six early. years, probably. I had when I uh, a lot of my first living in Albany was like focusing very much on on teaching and um, moving through lots of different studio situations and uh, not really making a lot of friends. Like really putting that aside which wasn't entirely healthy hey but like (laughs) this spring we got together and i was like we just like fully it was like oh this is this friendship's on now Hmm. and olivia i stayed with olivia and troy this summer and it was very useful transitory time yeah same for me can i ask where you practice so I teach um, at three different studios. I teach at Hard Space in Albany, Large Street Yoga in Albany, and Elevate 518, which is a studio in Loudonville. Um, but when I first moved to Albany three and a half years ago, I managed and taught a Jai Yoga school when they were te- on Madison. And like, I w- like really devoted all my energy to that space and like all my practice and learned so much and made so many wonderful connections. But when it was time to separate, it was like really time to mm. separate. Um, but it was really good for me to like diversify my teaching and to double down on, again, that passion of being like, this is what I do. Nothing, no studio or space or anything is going to stop me from stepping into this role because this is what I do. Right. If you come to my class, I'm just like, Hey, you're in here we're together like you're moving and you're fine just how you are that's what we're doing and that that's something that i feel so passionate about that's and i get great. to do fucking five days a week it's it's, it's, it's great what like <laughs> kind of yoga do you do uh, mostly vinyasa uh like a hatha vinyasa anything from gentle to like a power flow i teach all different levels throughout the week i teach i think i have nine nine classes and do like privates, do the whole like thing, and That's um, cool. it is it's uh, really wonderful, and it really has uh, maintained my love of singing and performing because I I have a do harmonium. you sing? Yes, <laughs> I'm not gonna make I'm not gonna make you sing oh, right good. now. Yes. I mean I can't anyway. I can't yeah, make no. you do anything. You definitely but, would not be able to. But <laughs> <laughs> great, yeah. great thing for a host to say. Yeah, yes. but uh, but yeah, it like uh, I've been I just started singing with like a Kirtan band, and we have like a show at the Alpoca Gallery this weekend, and it's what? just. I know on Saturday, Saturday night. Uh, There's a speaker. It's in the evening. I don't know if you have a thing, but you should be there. I have a show in the evening. I know. So so wait, say that again. Who do you sing with? (laughs) Um, It's this woman, Tara, and Kristen, and her husband, Alan. And they are all like... Do you guys have a name? I guess it's under Nourish, which is Tara's like baby. Um, She's a therapist who works at Elevate 518 and teaches... um, meditation she's wonderful they're wonderful they're all extremely talented like classically trained musicians i showed up i was like i don't know what i'm doing here but then we start like chanting like you know do the maha mantra a few times and you're just like yes like <laughs> you know you just like feel it there's this thing that happens when you sing and to sing with other women and to harmonize is like that's like my jam so yeah. you just like get lifted up <laughs> Yeah, no, it's... Um, and sick, yeah. yeah, like singing no, your I, nervous... I, I, speaking of nervous system. I <laughs> used to sing all the time yeah. when I lived alone downtown Troy mm. uh, because I lived alone. Yes, I sing almost. I live alone. I sing all the time. Uh, and Elisa, uh, they're my landlords. And I'm like... I sometimes, every time I see them, I'm like, I'm sorry, it's full concert last night. <laughs> I sang through all of Rent on, th- on this island <laughs> and yeah. Wicked last night alone. And they're like, yep. And I'm wow. Like, I'm like, yep. 
I did it. <laughs> <laughs> it feels good to sing. I it's... mean, I, I, I haven't been singing, and I did yesterday, like mm. for like an hour. I just was singing for like an hour. I felt so good. I felt mm. so in touch with something, you know? So uh, the vagus nerve, which runs mm-hmm. the length of your front body, it's a nerve that goes like from like kind of collarbone down through the diaphragm. Mm. When it vibrates, it actually triggers the parasympathetic nervous system. And that's the counter to sympathetic, the fight and flight. Parasympathetics, rest and digest, blood goes into the internal organs, your blood pressure, heart rate drops. This is like the nourish rest period. And singing actually activates that. You hearing singing, participating in singing. I was raised going to church. I don't know about church, but I love singing and I love mm, gospel singing. Same, yeah. And I was like, yeah, I'm down to go to church, mm. mom. You know why? Because it feels good. Yeah, Because it, it feels good. Hosanna in the highest. Like there are songs I remember from church that are just in there mm-hmm. forever. Mm-hmm. I, uh, the best that. analogy I had <laughs> for explaining church is we won't go into like, unless you want to, into that whole thing. <laughs> but, uh, for people who don't quite understand why people go to church, the best analogy I heard is, is it's like trying to understand why people go to a college football game, mm. only talking about the football, like the actual ball. The, the, like, if you think that church is just about, I don't know, some dogmatic belief in something, that's like trying to explain a football. Like, if you go to a right. college football yeah. game, it's, you know... Everybody dresses a certain way. There, there, there's certain rituals that you do. Mm-hmm. You all chant, Whole sing culture. together. You know, you, you you root for your team, but you're happy if they lose anyway. It's like it's a, it's a, it's not just about where the football is mm. in the game. You know what I mean? It's community, right? Right. Yeah. Right. So going to church can be the same type of thing. Mm-mm. Yes. There's just there's rituals that I like. It feels good. There's singing that I really enjoy. There's something about the energy and, and, and all these people coming together. Well, it's like you go to church and you're like, yeah, that felt good. But then it's like then you go home and sing for an hour and you're like, yeah, that felt good. I felt something. To me, that type of communal spirituality is the invitation. And even like a really good yoga class, it's the invitation to be like, wow, I really felt that. What, what happens if I go home and I sit with that feeling? What happens if I go home and journal on that or do that? It's like you cultivating that personal relationship mm. and that's people i people i love who are really into god or jesus i like as fully support them because it's like y- you've taken that time to like find what it is your it's my jesus yeah. it's yeah. my it's, it's my, my jesus, relationship yeah. with faith i like okay. talking to james rock about mm. that he's a very interesting guy and yeah. i i would love to talk to adrian too because i know he has his own thing mm. i talked to him a little bit about it at your show yeah yeah but yeah i'd love to talk to them oh, about yeah. that higher higher forces Super That's, important. We out here. They're happening. There's no other, not even acknowledge them. <laughs> there is something about music that it's it it seems w- like it would be weird if you didn't have some kind of a faith or belief in some kind of a thing that you can't really explain. Well, the way I think about it is like it's a perseverance, right? Because it's a skill, but it's a skill based on a practice, yeah. an individual practice, and like. I don't know what this means for me or like what it's actually connected to other than media in this life, maybe past lives, who knows, but I loved spirituals the most growing up Mm -hmm. as a child, a child, because I understood that they were things that helped you pass the time and have ease of moment while you were in complete trauma. Mm -hmm. You're just being made to labor. And I'd always thought that as a kid, that like that's the most beautiful song that could exist because it's carrying you, even though this is too much. Hmm. And that's always why I was connected to music because this is carrying you because this is too much. Now, whether or not the thing that's carrying you, whether or not music is related to God, I think is a whole other discussion. But like, well, I, what is God? I mean, you could like yeah. right. There's you all could, that. You could yeah. maybe all of those, every part of that sentence, right? Eat, mm-hmm. break it each down. That's why I think it's about person. It's like your personal price, your personal relationship. That's my agree. opinion. But I, I, I see it as, I mean, I, you can't speak for everybody, but I feel like it's your personal connection with something greater than you. Mm. Or, you know what I mean? Something something that you can't really get your fingers on. You it's can't. the zhuzh, baby. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, that yeah. feeling. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. But it takes a little bit of spirituality, faith, whatever you want to call it, 
to really grapple with it because mm. it's not material. You mm. know, it's not, it's not, well, it's, it's, well, it's this, it's this size. It weighs this much. You can make it come at this time and like this. It doesn't really work that way. It's mysterious. It's, you have to allow it. Yeah. And allowance isn't something that like we're really taught, especially in this culture or like by parents that it's like something's like prohibited or like the water's on full blast or like the water's off. And it's like, you can allow a few drips here and there for dripping. Like, you know, that's how I think about <laughs> crying, especially in this country is like tears come because it's a mechanical function of your body to release cortisol. You should allow that space. The reason you don't allow it is because you don't know what it looks like. Mm -hmm. But if you allow yourself to feel into it, it might just be okay. Isn't that cool? It is cool. Because so you don't know, you know, until you... Did too much crying today to hear about this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. Let it it's out. It's good, it's good, it's fine. I did it. It's done for today. <laughs> Maybe it's not, I don't know. It's like, honestly not. Well, because that's what... <laughs> music does is it's the same thing as like exercise for some people what passion does is like you allow yourself to create a vortex of your own energy so strong that nothing else can get in it's focus mm. you know i've played music for, for so long and with so many people and like like you're saying with the kirtan band like was this going to work for me or i was scared and then like the moment i got in with these women and really let go and allowed it there I was, there I was, and it's the thing, and you, and you realize that you can you can progress through so much more than you ever think you can, because the space in which you're allowing, when you're being, truly being, and allowing isn't a measurable space. Mm. It's a feeling space, it's a heart space, so it's like, it's not, you can't measure with your mind, like, okay, when I finally allow the feeling to take over, it's just meditation, you can't predetermine with your mental mind with your thinking thoughts like what's gonna happen when you go into the allowance space it's like no you don't know what's gonna happen that's the whole point yeah <laughs> it's practicing not knowing yeah but that's so into like capitalism though like if you allow shit to just be like then you don't need the thing to cover up the feeling <laughs> right you don't need to and buy we need this. to sell lots of things to cover up the feelings y'all there are no feelings actually i heard that if you keep buying enough shit there are just no more feelings they just go away i'm s i candles <sighs> help Lots of candles. I'm just kidding. I'm I yikes. test that particular theory. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, you're right. That's, that's been something that's been fun lately is like allowing myself to be like, oh God, I want to light incense right now. And yeah. then in the way that I was talking about, like going so slow, being like, is that more effort than I want to put through? Mm. And am I just doing that because I think that, you know, having the thing will make this better or can I just focus on being better right here? Mm. Mm. And it sucks <laughs> to be that aware, you know, sometimes because you're like, oh, it's like Victoria and I have this reaction between each other a lot where it's like, fine, I guess I'll do it. <laughs> I see it. It's there. Like the work. to do the work, I guess. We're doing it. Yeah, I guess yeah. it's happening. But yeah, <laughs> so it's that's been interesting to be like, oh, right. Like, it's really interesting you talking about allowing and how your body does these things mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. We resist it. Mm -hmm. Uh I started getting these headaches about a year ago. I actually mm -hmm. had a physical therapist on here a couple of weeks ago, Matthew Goodemote, and we talked about how what helped me was figuring out what, like, I would get a headache and I would just get all in my head about it. You know, mm -hmm. like, now the day is ruined. I, like, how can I make this go away? And what, what helped was the opposite of what you think would help, which is, okay, yeah, I'm in pain right now. You know, like... This is, yes, this is the correct response my body has to whatever's happening inside mm. it. And then calm down. Be like, okay, the pain's telling me to stop doing whatever I'm doing. Don't do that. <laughs> it, but allow, it, allow the pain. Allow yourself to feel what you're feeling. Try to relax. Breathe. And it takes care of it. It does it for mm. you. You don't, have to, you don't have to do anything. Mm. That's... <laughs> Mm -hmm. well, it's like the spiraling around the seed of sensation that's like almost as agitating or uh, exhausting as the sensation itself. Mm -hmm. uh, my therapist gave me a great tool, which is when things happen, it's like you say, acknowledge it. It's like this. And more than just acknowledging, yes. So it's af affirming that it's happening. And I was like, why do I love this so much? And I was like, oh, it reminds me of that meme. It'd be like that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, oh, it's yes. <laughs> yeah, like, it'd be like that sometimes, headache. I mean, I just have to feel this way. Man, yeah. that's so corny. That's right. Yeah, we, we talked it's about the difference. Simple. It's, it's one of the things it's that like is this. simple. Yeah. yeah. So many things are rarely simple in this life. So. Yes. 
Yes, he it, he yeah. just said that's the difference pain. between pain and suffering. Mm. He said pain, you pain is inevitable. Suffering is a choice, mm. and it's so true. It's hard. It's you can't mm. tell someone that who's suffering. You can't go up to them and be like, "Stop suffering. Yeah. You're choosing to do this." Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely not. It doesn't help. Nope. That well, doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know that I've prolonged periods of suffering because I won't allow pain. And what's been hardest for me in my recovery with this particular thing in my life is that uh, it's just still painful. Mm -hmm. I'm just, uh, there was a really, really beautiful um, poet, Mia, Mia, I cannot remember your last name, but she came through and was, uh, they came through and were in uh, the feature for Poetic Vibe at Troy Kitchen, hosted by Dee Collins. And it was beautiful and they had one poem that was talking about being in a relationship and how you know I think the way the stanzas were hitting were like month by month so like month one everything's great we're going good you know and so you know it was an immediate good like you immediately were feeling it Mm -hmm. because that's a timeline that all of us think about you know and it was very relatable and she's saying like you know you know uh month eight I'm still sick and you don't understand it. And I keep trying to tell you that you can't fix me right now. I'm just still sick. I'm just, and I just like, you know, I lost it because I was able to feel that this is just still painful for me. And in the, in the world of wanting, my head wants to be like, you can stop this. You're suffering. And it's like, no, it's actually just still really painful. It's just painful. Mm-hmm. It's just taking a really long time. There's just a lot of pain to sort through. And that's interesting. And I feel like, wow, that must be a huge part of the human struggle as I struggle with it so delicately because I think I have a pretty good fucking handle on a lot of this shit, you know, for being a solo person. Like, I I do try to give myself credit where I can, but at the same time, this intricacy, these nuances are are really difficult when you're like, oh, I'm just still in pain. I had to, like, make that allowance today. That's like, I'm just still in pain. And there's a lot of good reasons that the pain happened. And I moan and I am still acknowledging a lot of the reasons. And a lot of that pain is is present moment also. It isn't just me clinging to my past. And it, it's just so interesting how we're geared to be punitive to our emotional healing selves to, to that allowance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because we can. It's it's the softest part of us. So we can punish it so easily, but like that punishing really ooh. I don't know if this is true for you, but I found mm. that my ego gets wrapped up in that. Mm. Like mm-hmm. uh, when I want, when I've decided the pain has gone on too long, like somehow yeah. my ego is like, well, I don't. This is too long. Yes, you know, I, yeah, you know, Impatient. and it's, that's your ego. That's that's your ego for me. For me, I can't speak for you. For me, it's my ego coming out and saying, I don't. Mm. I'm not. I'm not that weak. You know, I mm. don't have pain that long. I overcome things quicker than this. Mm. So fuck you, pain. And it doesn't work. It's just that that's when you start to work. suffer. Yes. That's that's yeah. when you start to suffer oh, because dude, you. Yeah. I feel like we've talked about this. Live like the mm. just impatience. It's like I've been doing the work. I'm doing the work. It's continuous. Haven't I done this? And now I have to do with it a different way. Again and again and again forever. Never stops. It never stops, and I just want to get off the roller coaster, but we're strapped in. Yeah. Right. And it gets. It, I think it gets more manageable. You start enjoying a lot of parts of it, or you start being able to anticipate how certain imbalances are going to come on, mm. despite you having balance. Like you're saying, like 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 there's life has pain. Like there's going to be pain, and how you can anticipate the pain, even sometimes, without clinging to suffering. Like, I always said that, like, suffering is, like, the um, the underbelly of miracles. Because mm. as soon as you can release the things that are trying to suffer in you, you'll realize just how magical you are. Mm. Now, within that, I think that's, like, just a whole thought devoted to, like, what oneness is, which is, like, it's everything. It's dark yeah. and light combined. Yep. We don't get to it's choose, space right? beyond duality. Yeah. yeah. We all, we're like, we got to love everything. And I'm like, no, love is an opposite to hate. We actually, the goal is to just be beyond that. And that, that's terrifying, I it think. It is. Because it's like, oh, that means that we don't have language for it. Mm-hmm. That means we don't have, like, mm-hmm. uh, maybe proper perception to hold it yet without right. practice. And 
non-dualism. I, I'm very, I'm very into that. <laughs> it's uh, the closest I can come and be honest about it is I'm trying to attain balance. Mm. You know what I mean? I'm not, not quite equanimity. beyond it because I live in I'm I live in this world yes. and I I I am a, a du I am full of duality. Yes. I am. So my goal is always to just try to recognize I'm leaning too far this way. And honestly, not to hate on like love conquers all because love is an incredibly powerful force. And as long as we do live in the material world and are connected to things, it's very noble Mm. to strive for that ultimately. But again, like balance or equanimity, peacefulness, like, you know. Have you ever gotten out of balance with your need for balance? Oh, that's yeah. a mind fuck. Like, <laughs> like that's <laughs> well, it's just like I have. To, I will. I have to practice this yes. way. I have to only eat these things. I yes. have to do this. I have to. It goes back to perfectionism, where it's just like this is how I practice to feel the best. And it's like actually, you're just a little. I'm yes. A little wound a little tight this week, and what you need to do is sit down and watch Netflix for six hours. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I say it is sometimes I gotta let a little chaos in. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I, I'll, I'll I'll like. It's easy to meditate in a cave. You can't. Yeah. You gotta meditate Ooh, yeah. in uh, Target I, mm, Christmas can... time. Can you do that? Yes, yeah, I do that. <laughs> yeah, I believe That's that. That's why I took a retail job again this uh, season. <laughs> And I was like, no, I'm going to cancel all my Thanksgiving plans, and I'm going to embody my fucking stillness in <laughs> oh, that in wow. Fallsgate's Mall on Black Friday. Yes, yes, oh, I yes, can't yes, wait. Yes, It'll yes. be such a challenge. <laughs> Nothing can touch me. They, they I will might. see you there. I love Black Friday. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, um, <laughs> but uh, here's something that I've thought of, which I know is controversial um, in our dualistic culture. So as we're seeing spirituality and as we're seeing like self-care come to a rise, there is such a perfectionism right associated with that. And sort of um, absolutism, really. Mm. And so sober culture is a huge thing now, as it should be. Mm. Many people should be getting sober. Not everybody has addiction run through them in that way. I couldn't make addiction run through me in the way that, like, I'm itching for a fix. Like, it's just never been the way that I've... I'm. It's not my experience. My experience is like, yes, I've had times where, like, we're drinking too much and I stop. Mm -hmm. And I don't drink for, like, a year and a half. And then maybe I'll start drinking again, or maybe I won't. And I've always been able to allow that. So I have this like fear sometimes that it's like, well, and, and because I've, I've felt it happen, that's like people who need that sort of devoutness of sober life. Uh, I feel, I fear judgment from those people mm-hmm. um, that like, maybe if I were just not using substance at all, putting all of that aside, my whole point is this <laughs> in inviting chaos in, or inviting in situations, and this is discussed a lot in all sorts of literature, but a lot of stuff that um, the problematic person, George, Jordan Peterson, a lot of people view him as very, very problematic, right? <coughs> but <coughs> Yeah, okay. Well, that's what I'm saying. He's controversial. He allows chaos. He allows himself to talk about all of it, but he did make a point that my aunt once raised to me, which is like, humans have been, you know, manipulating and like... Uh, manipulating and like affecting their consciousness with substance for thousands of years it's a very human thing now being Mm -hmm. addicted to something and having it rule your life is like well i mean you can't have that but she was because she was basically being like relax like just smoke weed if you want to smoke weed or do whatever you you need to do and so i don't have the urge to drink a lot at all but lately and especially over the past like day knowing that i'd be hitting more depressed emotions and then I would also avoid feeling them. I was like, hmm. let's drink some whiskey and see how that feels. Hmm. And I was able to sink into the sadness. I also have enough self-control where it's like, I took a shot of whiskey. And like mm-hmm. let that chaos, that difference, that sudden you know change in chemistry in my brain, what does that feel like? Mm-hmm. I'm fortunate in the same way where yeah. I can do that. I can it's like, a tool. It's a tool. Yeah, I can it's be cool. like, I'm going to drink too much tonight. You know, I'm going to drink more than I should tonight. And just see. And, and then I probably will, will feel like crap tomorrow. And then I won't want to do it again for a very long time. But I'm going to have a lot of fun tonight. Mm. And I need that today. Mm. And I, I shouldn't withhold that from myself because other people can't handle that. You know mm. what I mean? Well, yeah. And well, and I found though, like as you, what you were mentioning from the beginning is like having heightened perceptivity or sensitivity. I found that the, the more I heighten that... I can have the let go experience on one and a half drinks that used to take me seven or eight Hmm. to get to. So it's really like you can allow the substance to work through you if you're, if you allow your sensitivity to raise, but Mm. a lot of people, you know, are using it to numb out 
So it it's like an antithesis that like when you become conscious as to like how alcohol is affecting you, you're like, oh shit, I have to stop, <laughs> you know, and I never <clears throat> used it that way. So it's like, yeah, it's interesting to be able to be like, okay, I'm much more sensitive. Like if I have like two drinks, it's like, you know, I'm out to lunch, but it's like, woo, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and feeling great about it and being like, oh, right. I don't, that's not going to make me feel like complete shit tomorrow. And tonight I can consume enough food or I can like, it's like, yeah, it's like allowing myself to be that aware Mm -hmm. is actually safer ultimately because just little bits of things give me what used to be the full experience from like full throttles like i don't know full throttle just (laughs) i i can do like it seems to be once a quarter you know yeah like kiki's wedding that day i got i drank quite a bit Mm, i I wasn't even at the wedding (laughs) oh i I came to the after party yeah no (laughs) <laughs> uh, i remember you there at the, the after party the chromoscope party they're having a halloween party oh, i'm yeah, gonna right. drink i'm gonna drink too much at that party mm. i shouldn't even say the word too much i'm gonna drink the amount that's okay for me that night you're gonna be jovial and, oh, and yeah. <laughs> celebrate and i'm gonna i because i haven't since then you know i haven't really had much to drink mm. you know i might have a beer with dinner sometime just because i like the taste of it mm-hmm. but i need like i need a little bit of that Chaos. I'm not completely in control of my of everything, you know. Yeah, I need a little bit of that. It's sometimes. nice to conduct that experiment. It's an experiment yeah. that people should conduct because it's like, I mean, and not always that way. Yes, we get it. Some people cannot yes. experiment that way, but it's like life is. What's the first thing they teach you in fucking like sixth grade, seventh grade about science is like hypotheses, the scientific <laughs> process, and it's like yes, that is life. <laughs> but okay. you just try shit. Can we loop this back to like community care though? Yeah. When you like kind of let Jesus take the wheel, another throwback, and are in like a group of friends and you're like, yeah, I'm going to have that fifth drink. Fuck it. <laughs> like you kind of are making yourself vulnerable to be held by your community, right? I, w- yeah, I was going to wow. say that. It, like it means I trust you in a way. It's, what I'm saying is I feel close enough and safe enough, in safe this con- enough with you that I'm going to let myself into a state that I don't allow myself into most of the time. There well, are that lots could be of dangerous. Yeah, there are lots of ways to do that besides drugs and alcohol in within True. trust and relationships, within all types of things to ex- to explore and experience that sense of give and take. Like there are lots of ways to <laughs> get. Funny. Yeah, there are lots of ways to explore that. I think I've Long. always wanted to do that <laughs> in romantic relationships, and it's, it's mm. confused a lot of women because they're like, "Why are you like you look uncomfortable?" I'm like, "I am uncomfortable. This isn't what I want to do." Mm. But I want, but I want to be in a relationship where I can do things. It's not really what I want to do, you know, like like experience. <laughs> yeah, do, I want to know, we'll unpack that a little do, bit. Do, but, like um, where I want to say things that I would normally withhold. Oh, okay, yeah. Or where I want to like answer a question process. as perfectly honestly as I can mm. in a ways that take time, mm. you know. Yeah. And they're like, Showing "Why are you doing this to self. yourself?" And I'm because because I can I can stretch here. You know, I should be able to stretch here. And if you don't want to do that with me, that's also a good indicator of like in the supposed partner place of like, this isn't stretchy time. You're not yeah. the stretchy one. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. You need a stretchy one. Yeah. You, you need somebody, somebody who stretches with your stretch. Well, right. And, or at least exactly. like is in enough allowance place. Because I think people can have different levels of stretch mm. if if we're that's holding true. allowance in the relationship. Because – and because that's to allowance well that's something i've learned <laughs> with trauma processing is like i've literally had times where it's like i've taken on too much and it feels ridiculous but it's just like oh wow i can only do two things a day in relationship it is often very hard to practice the allowance of like hey so you and i are in a romantic relationship say or you and i are like we're having a committed exchange within our committed exchange mm. that is this relationship you were talking about some of this today that it's like learning to be like okay what I've had to learn just in having any relationship with my trauma and then any relationship with a human outside of myself is that like, I have to be able to hear from other people, but also be able to say like, okay, cool. And I can't process any more of this right now. Mm. Mm-hmm. And th- and that's just where I am. And it doesn't mean that I don't want to. It just means like, that's the cap on my experience today. And I don't know how to yeah. keep, and you're allowed to have that too. But I mm-hmm. often feel like people do this marathon shit when they do initially turn on the emotions, and I definitely am guilty of this, right? Where it's like, no, 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 let's get through all of it. And it's like, that's also perfectionism. 
Yeah, that's true. I'm, I'm similar to that. And abuse. Yeah. You know, I've found that t- for me to with other people, but also with myself to be a very abusive tactic to like feign Caring. productivity mm. um, in myself. That it's like, well, I got through, well, I, oh, I looked at all of it. And it's like, yeah, you might have looked at all of it, but like what good is an angry rabbit with two sick children at home looking at every single leaf in the forest? Doubt that your brain had enough space for you to actually see what was on each leaf. Damn. You didn't. Yeah. You were in a bad processing place. You could only take on so much. If we if we aren't able to be honest that it's like your eyes aren't open yet, but I saw everything today, fuck you. <laughs> From 10 to 3, I saw you, bitch. You were walking around with your eyes closed. And, and that's the whole thing is like, you know, we have to be honest about that. And when we can be honest about those things, it creates space for understanding that other people have boundaries too, that they're probably not safely able to express or haven't learned that they can yet yeah boundaries take two people that's a crazy thing something yeah. that i love about our friendship though at the time we like connected i was like oh i actually have like these limits and it's safe to just be like okay yeah i'm closing my bedroom door now good night yeah. <laughs> goodbye <laughs> goodbye love you <laughs> yeah i actually right. allowed myself something to, uh it's, i guess you could call it a bad habit it is especially in romantic relationships i zone out like mm. a lot of times like if somebody telling me a bunch of things i don't hear it all it's like some part of me maybe it's like childhood i just learned to i learned to like only identify certain information it's selective hearing Mm. i definitely have that Mm -hmm. uh and so what i've done is to say if you really need me to hear something please make sure i heard you you know what i mean i'm trying to listen to you but i go i i like when when you have a really long long like story about your day that's like seven stories i go into this place where i'm not really listening to you and i'm just being polite Mm. and i know that that can be annoying i'm sorry that that's annoying it's also where i'm at you know and i'm trying really hard do you know what i mean yeah but what are you gonna say well it's there's two two things really good to communicate that that Oh, to have that awareness and to communicate that to anyone because that will give them the tools to actually connect with you. But also, like, grow active listening is a, a, a good skill to cultivate. Yes. And listening, it's not just listening <laughs> to the words. It's, like, creating the container for the person to, like, share that experience where you're receiving all of the information. <laughs> and that that's, like, an allowance thing where it's, like, I'm not letting myself get in the way, like – if you're tired or busy and being like, I can't listen to you right now because what, what I, I really actually want to hear you all the mm-hmm. way. So I'm going to actually take a beat. So when I hear you, I'm like absorbing and yes. not just. It's like, th- this is different <coughs> because I've set an intention. I'm here mm. to yeah. listen yeah. and then yeah, to hold talk. that, hold that space. But when it, when it happens, <coughs> I guess naturally in life, I can't always be in that state. Mm. I just, I just can't. I'm not, not, not capable of doing it. Yeah, not yet. <laughs> but but if you tell me this is imp- if you say I need you to listen to me, I'm there, you know. Mm-hmm. Or I'll say I can't right now. I really can't. When's your birthday? <laughs> a- <laughs> April nineteenth. Cool, cool, cool. Thanks. Uh, you know Kiki's <laughs> sister Izzy. Yeah. She did everything on mine, and she oh, said yeah. I am like the most Aries person she's ever met. That makes sense to me. It do does. You re- do you yeah. remember them off the top of your head? Uh, I'm my moon sign, my sun sign. I think <coughs> Mars. I think I can't remember what Are else. They all Aries? Aries. They're like all Aries. Yeah. Damn, a lot of Aries energy in my life recently. Uh, <laughs> kind of love it. Yeah. <laughs> but y'all are cool. Yeah. <laughs> I resisted that label. Everybody should resist their astrological label because we are not but one sun sign. Unless you find out that your chart is literally just Aries. <laughs> and then it's like, and well. And then it's like, okay, here comes the reckoning. But like, honestly, it's your own personal reckoning. This whole like. <coughs> it's the same as like classism or any ism yeah you know astrology ism then it's like oh my god you're such a leo it's like fuck i associated <coughs> aries with all the negative things right. and izzy helped me she said no i really actually like aries my kid is an aries mm. and she said you guys you guys see the world like children mm-hmm. you have very you have very high hope idealistic hopes for the way things can be and it's nice and possibly yeah. warm when they care about you impossibly my, one of my mm-hmm. all-time best friends maggie talbot minkin she lives in harlem shout out um <laughs> she is a double aries and it's just like so radiates such warmth and acceptance towards me and no bullshit and calls me out on my shit i have no space for bullshit it's I wonderful just, 
I just don't. Yeah. I think it's a waste of time. It is. <laughs> and I, I either, I either, I'm either comfortable enough to say this is bullshit. Or you're not. Or I'm not comfortable <laughs> enough, in which case I'm just not listening. You know, I'm like not, I'm not participating in, in your bullshit because... <laughs> Because I do not consent to your bullshit. <laughs> yeah, I'm well, leaving. Because I can't take this. I mean, it's sort of like back to what you're saying, though. Like, <clears throat> not what you're saying, but what you began with. And, like, you're trying to get better at, like, actively listening. Mm-hmm. What I've learned as the person that usually is pretty good at having the story and then also seven stories at once is that, like, sometimes you really have got to be conscious of, like, what you're communicating. Because if you know your listener... You know what I mean? That's a two-way street as well that I've had to learn. I've had to take on that, like, I'll find people who are congruent to me and that, like, they will make the space to be listened to. But it's sort of traumatic because I'm unloading mm. and they're taking it all. I get that. That's I, that's I, when I'm actively I mean? listening. Yeah. It can be very painful for me yes. because I'm I'm really putting myself as much as I can into your shoes and trying and, to feel what you're feeling and, and yeah. that can be exhausting and i can't do that with like i can't do that with some stupid thing that happened today why you know therapy it's like exists yeah. I was you say, know what i mean like that's, that's my favorite codependent outlet to just sublimate myself to someone else's life and pretend that i couldn't exist and they just fill fill right. up well, the I void just, yeah i've learned so in the past couple yeah. years yeah. just how painful unhealthy. you can inflict so much pain as that mm. kind of communicator mm. because you're setting up an expectation of no boundary and that you have to listen to me mm. that's the only way things get done and you not hearing me is based on you being a bad listener and like while some of those aspects might be true the other aspect is that like if we have a swollenness here i don't think one person is creating the deficit mm. You know what yeah. I mean? Like to have like a cave of like we need three trillion dollars is not just a one sided thing. You know what I mean? The opening, the the cavern had to exist like for that sort of mega pull to happen. So it's like I've just had to learn and speaking as the devil's advocate to what you're saying that like, yes, that'd be great that you'd be a better listener. But like gaining that skill back is also a trauma we reworking that is not linear mm. you cannot expect someone you love like yes if it's very important it's like hey like you're saying you've put it out there that like if this is really important that you're listening to me i'm like we're connected hi this is important yeah. to me so you're asking someone to be intentional with what they're saying yes and if someone's that's it that's being exactly fully intentional it. they probably don't need to say all of the sh- yes that's true and yes. that creates because <laughs> talking about anything makes it a reality. Mm. And so it's like, if your idea of a relationship is that I get to unload or vent and this person is there for me, then you need a therapist and that is a very unhealthy thing. Mm. Everybody needs a therapist. Well, that's true. Everybody (laughs) does. And that's the other thing about it is that it's like, yes, so it's not unreasonable for you to need to vent. It's not unreasonable for you to need to figure out how to have these conversations better. But using the one possible partner or like your multiple partners or whoever family to as as the backboard is like, what happens to a basketball when you hit the backboard? That's the so hoop, true. The hoop is the swish, right? The backboard is there to get slammed against. Mm. People need to be exchanged real services for the slam against. Mm. You know, if I'm already in a relationship with you and you get cancer, mm. that area has been created. I'm here to be the backboard now. That's an agreement that we've settled on. There's already a, a dignified respect. How do we create that dignified respect outside of family and close relationships? With money. Mm. Mm. That's it. So it's like, yeah, the therapist is there to take a beating. <laughs> they know how to do it. That's what they're good at. They're it's good at so being true. the backboard. That's it. But, you know, so it's like you got to be honest with yourself about, like, working through shit is that, like, it, it is it is that brash. Yeah. And no one I, in your life can I take did, it on. I, I did notice that, like, because of <laughs> things that have happened to me in the past with other people. Mm. I get afraid that if you figure out I'm not listening to you, you're going to get mad at me. Mm. You know what I mean? Like you're going to get really mad that I didn't hear everything you said. It's like not so, responding right away on your phone. That sounds like right. a similar it's chord. It's a very yeah. similar thing. It's it's like I've kind of been trained to think, oh, God, I don't remember this being said. Mm. I'm going to get in trouble. You know, mm. I'm going to get yelled at. And I don't want to get yelled at. Mm. So in a, in a way, I'm almost afraid to bring it up. I'm afraid to, to even to say, I'm not listening to you right now. 
you know, I'm, yeah. you know, <laughs> well, and that creates I, <laughs> a web of lies if you're not willing to like, yeah, right. The initial that's can snowball really that's quick. The truth. It's like, I know that you have a lot of things you want to talk about and I'm more than willing to sit here while you do that, mm. but I can't listen to all of it, yeah. you know? No. And that's, you're kind of subconsciously projecting yourself. That makes me also wonder, like you saying that, I mean, we've already just, it's like, this is where my brain goes. Right. Um, cause I, I'm always analyzing something, which is part of the good part of being a songwriter and like the negative part of being a songwriter. And it's not just because of songwriting, but anyhow, it makes me wonder about school. And I noticed with a lot of men that I'm close with that, that whole like, Oh, I wasn't listening. To my it's like the expectation of a young boy, especially the way that they are wired and young children to always be taking in all the information in the classroom that happens. Mm. So then when you don't get something on a test right, or so when you're called on, a lot of the punitive shit that I remember from elementary school, and it's kind of like, I'm, I'm right here on this you're mic so saying, on. fuck the American <laughs> school institution, <laughs> yes. because it is not about building a safe cabin for learning. I don't care. Nobody's really figured it out, okay? It's about making money, and it's about having standards and... Sending st- people to prison. Sending people to prison <clears throat> and states <laughs> being able to compete with each other based on test scores, region scores, and tax law. I'm done with with it's that. It's really portion. interesting you said that because I do. I, I immediately jump back to certain classes where I would write down word for word everything that was written down by the teacher in my head, knowing I'm never going to look at this. Yeah. Hmm. You know, I'm yeah. going to study from the book. What an exhausting thing to do. You know what I mean? Yes. But but I had to have it all down. I had to well, have it. Because, sh- I mean, think about the first time I think about it. What a shameful thing. I was so good at performing as a kid that I was able to hide from other kids that it affected me. But I remember so many little boys, especially, like, Jeremy. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, Jeremy? <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> Kevin? Tyler? What's the... Are you paying attention? Okay, then what's the answer to the problem on the blackboard? And it's like... Just and that it's like this punitive That's thing. That's a really good point. They it has did... nothing to do with learning. It has everything to do with shaming this child for not being on all the time. Fuck that. That is That's so a really good point. For perfectionist, high achieving children, it's a way to cultivate an entire identity that is super valid and good. And that that's, that's true. even more fun to like you build your whole identity on being a good student. Do you do you think there's something with the sexes there that like maybe young boys have a harder time with that or hmm. or. Do you think? Because I wonder. Because I've, I've, I mean, I remember being a young boy, and I remember my brother especially. Mm. Very hard to pay attention. Mm. You know, very hard, mm. very hard to not want to just be moving all the time. You know, mm-hmm. just like I want to go do something. I want to go in, and really easy to, to get distracted by anything. Yeah. That's what I honestly think. The original. I know that it's used and has been used for hundreds of years as like a euphemism for like boys will be disgusting but i think that's where boys will be boys comes from is that Mm. it's like yeah little boys are just they're like it's like kittens like you know they're just like fucking they're they're getting into shit but it's also like is that not related to the engendering of the the mass engendering and programming of men and women that men are immediately told and young boys are told to like shut off Hmm. their sensitivities to things so of course you would have this wild like negative reaction to like you're not supposed to like this and you're not supposed to like this and you're not supposed to like trucks and blah, blah, blah and whatever and women hmm. are so conditioned from the get-go i remember being a little girl being like okay if i can make my hair nice and if i can make things nice so it's like yeah so you go into school and what are you gonna do you're gonna make things you're gonna be a good girl hmm. and you know i think that there really is something to the good girl and the bad boy oh, and that yeah, bad that's... boys are allowed and good girls are you being a good girl? Because they're no bad girls. That's interesting. Because you know what? That's that's I mean, why. Are, I'm sure, but there are. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird you say that because you think about the like the boys who either got to a place where they didn't care if they got yelled at, and they were always the cool ones. Mm. Yeah. You know, they were always the cool ones. Shameless. Yeah, it's it's like I know what you're doing, and I then we're like, where does shit. rape culture come from? Mm. You condition these boys to be shameless about their actions, to like literally fuck something up and walk away, mm. and be like, yeah, I did that. Ha. So then they do it to ha. women, and we're like, surprised? Are you kidding? It's so simple. It's weird because so in simple. a way, there's not much of another escape. It's like mm. either be nervous all the time. That you're going to get yelled at mm. or don't care about what I 
think about you and well, when you I yell at you. You have to shut off, right? Yeah. You have to go back to sleep on your whole I thing. I never thought about that. Oh, I never thought wow. about that before. That's so cool. I'm glad you get to think about that now. <laughs> I, I do. I do too. Yeah. That's, I think that's huge for men right now is that like women are overswollen. It seems me as, as a female person in this body, like overswollen with these de- worries, domestic, taking care of and otherwise to like completely consume myself in how much I'm seen and what I'm showing to people. And, and to me, it seems like this concave opposite with men where it's like, we don't want to see you present something else, mm. present something else, present something else, make it sexy, make it powerful. And then women also have the, like, this is the craziest thing to me about relationships where like I was even programmed this way and had to shut it down where it's like, yeah, now that I'm in a heteronormative relationship with a man that I care about, I'm like, I need you to have all the power of the things that I need you to be sexy in the way that men are sexy. Hello. Mm. I'm a damsel. I'm a damsel. Excuse me. I'm assuming damsel status. Excuse me. That's weird as a guy. Of (laughs) of course, that must be horrible. In the the reverse, where it's like, it's just so confusing. Yes. It's it's incredibly confusing because you're like, but you you told me you don't want me to be that way. Mm. It's it's like, have have every boundary, but pretend there are no boundaries. Right. Right. Like, it's like, to me, that's like the oxymoron of a rape fantasy. Mm. Yeah, or or the other one. Be yeah. tender with me, but tend to this right. like completely violent right. delusion. Hey, treat Woo! me, treat me. The, the other one, I don't want to complain too much, but like, the other one is like, treat me like an adult, except when I don't want you to. Mm. You know, mm. and that's like, no. Either I treat you like an adult, an equal, or I don't. Well, that, you know, yeah. you know what I mean. Like, yes. I I can have space for everything. You know, be like, this is hard for me, or I need I need some I need. This is this is an area where I'm uncomfortable, where I feel unsafe. That's totally fine, mm. but it's different to be like, I don't want to be held accountable for my actions in this area. Mm. Take care of me you now. Know? Yeah, me yeah. As a child, right. parent me, and it's like, no, no, no. I'm having sex with you. There will be no parenting if we're both <laughs> right. if we're both learning how to reparent. If we're both learning how to reparent, that's a whole other conversation. But there will be no. I'm gonna hold this tender part of you and say, baby, 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 baby. It's all good. <laughs> no, it's not all good. Grow the fuck up. Yeah. I'm not holding that kind of space. I hold that space for myself so that I can survive. But isn't that just getting too drunk and letting your friends take care of you? Isn't that part of community care on that's some fair. level? I think. But I think when you're, if you're being kind to yourself about it, you know what I mean? Being in this, I think that like the asking for boundaryless in relationship can be particularly unkind. I think it can too without consent. Right. And I think that Mm. if you create the boundaries and if people are agreeing to certain things, it can actually be a space of real vulnerability where you're saying those whole truths and it's actually healing. Mm. Mm. That's what I want ultimately. Mm -hmm. Right? But I find that this is another wine. But I find I find are they wines? What? Are they? Yeah. I, f- I feel like I'm whining. You're I not. I don't think you are. I don't think, I think, think you're okay. raising points that yeah. maybe you haven't gotten to raise. Before. Okay, that's fair. Thank you. Mm-hmm. You're welcome. I uh, I forgot. I lost I'm it. I'm so sorry. That's okay. What you want ultimately? We're talking about ultimate. Oh, vulnerability. so if you if you want that sort of vulnerability, you will attract people who want a vulnerable person. Mm. You know what I mean? And and interesting. You know, yeah, it's yeah. a magnet for it. It's like. I not think, and not not like not like that's the only people. Yeah, I but, think that's it's too hard to do across the board, and I think that everyone is vulnerable. True. <laughs> true. You know, like, well, your I brand like, of vulnerability, right? Maybe I guess so. it's like you're either vulnerable. Like, yes, there are different styles of vulnerability, but it's like you're either being f- your full authentic self, which is vulnerable, or yes. you're not. Yep. Yes. That's what it is. Yeah. I'll I use this as an example, what it is, and I don't want to. To give credit to these people, someone who's had something terrible happen to them and they want to be in a position where they have power, mm. especially romantically, mm. find it, are attracted to someone who's being vulnerable because it immediately allows them to be in a position where I know your vulnerabilities and you don't know mine. Or I won't allow you to use them against me somehow. You know, I've I've built I've got scar tissue around my vulnerability because I got really hurt really badly and I know I can, you know, latch onto this and it's easy and it doesn't touch the scar tissue. Yes. I'm sorry. That sounds uncomfortable. But that's also me. You know, I'm attracting that. Mm. You know, oh. I can't I can't well I can't mm. I can't I can't like 100% discount myself. 
Well, yes, you are co-creative in the bonds when you participate in them, but there's something else that needs to be spoken for here, and I'm, I'm going to ride this point home because you and I have hit this subject every single time we've talked, and we've really only talked like four times, yeah. okay? So this must this is a common thread that I'm picking up on, and I'm not mean to this part of myself anymore. I was had by a man in his 40s when I was a five-year-old. My first romantic relationship was with a grown man. I didn't do that. Mm. I didn't create that pattern. That's true. I'm responsible for cleaning it up, but I don't have to every time a man gawks at me in the street and I'm like, oh God, they're picking up on something that they're familiar with, something vulnerable that they understand that they can manipulate. It's like, yes, it's it's my responsibility to own that vulnerability in a different way to allow it to transform. It is not my responsibility to punish myself because that energy is coming to me. Mm. That wasn't my... That's, I didn't do that to myself. <laughs> that's why establishing boundaries has been so important for me. Mm. Saying things Every, for everyone. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So important for everybody. <laughs> yes. Saying things like, I'm not listening to you right yeah. now. Yeah. You know, or, or if you need me to listen to you, I need you to tell me. You know, mm. because and, the, and then you go to the therapist and they massage the scar tissue. And then it loosens. Yeah. And then when you're ready, you can be your whole authentic self. And the person who's going to meet you there is going right. to come into your life. There's also like, I think, I think for a while maybe I allowed myself to be too vulnerable too quickly mm. you know like oh same always yeah like, like a little bit like didn't an realize open wound. i didn't even know i was doing it <laughs> yeah, i was like 15 to 25 yeah. that was just like, ah. you're an open wound and you're like why did i get infected so quickly it's like well you should kind of let it heal maybe before just no, like no, giving no. yourself to Healing. someone no, it's <laughs> also maybe know a little bit more about this person uh, yeah. Or you the know, wound, yeah, right? Because yeah. it's the wound that's attracting the thing, um, and that is what true. I hear. What you're saying in that, and like, and that's what I hear coming across. And like, well, but it's me. It's like, yeah, it's your woundedness. And like, until you forgive the wounded part of yourself, you're gonna attract people that know how to work that wound. That's so and be true. like, what are you talking about? This doesn't hurt. And the knife is in there. Yeah, but it's like, yes. But you left Ga- like gaslighting yeah. me. But it, but it's like, but <laughs> it's know? like, but you left it open, yeah. and you and you invited them over after yeah. you saw their knives. Right. This doesn't hurt. You're like, oh, you have a knife collection? Maybe you should come over for a little bit. I mean, I don't have any open wounds. I mean, I don't have any open wounds. It's fine. Like, I'm, I'm completely... Because, because I've realized for me, like, you know, when you don't know how to um, necessarily... And it's it's a pie chart, right? This doesn't... And this is an absolute or extreme in that, like, nobody... That you don't know how to root any of your energy. But what I've noticed in recoursing through trauma is that it's like oh, wow, I really don't know how to allow all of this to be seen. Mm. Um, so an addiction that I do have to that that I think is also related to sexuality and sex culture is like, I'm just going to expose all of myself to you really, 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 really quickly. And it's like that is, I mean, also a habit that comes from how danger messed up I was with when I was a kid, but that it's like I'm just going to submit myself to complete nothingness, to danger, to a situation that has me and it's like mocking surrendering, but it's not. It's right. an addiction to being completely out of control because that's where your trauma brings you. Mm. And maybe I deserve this. Maybe I deserve this because I can't stop it from happening. Guess what? You stop picking the people with the knives. It stops happening. Mm. But you so have to admit that you're in love with the people with the knives. Yeah. Because some cavern in you was created where you're like, no, 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 this is love. I remember my therapist when I was living in Texas, my therapist, I I kept saying something about like the pedophilic person that had me as a kid. And she was like, Olivia, it wasn't love. He didn't love you. It wasn't love. Mm -hmm. It wasn't love. And that's the lie I kept telling myself. That's that's the tragedy of those things. Right. And you have to accept that. But it's taken me so long to accept that like I as a child was, you know, loving this person, I thought, because they told me they were loving me or that. That's, you know, and so accepting that is like, oh, it makes everything fallible. That makes a lot of things like hard to look at or maybe not after a while, which is a point that I'm starting to understand in my own psychology that like it's almost harder to admit that you're beyond, that you're okay. Mm. That's a huge part of my healing right now is like, oh, wow. Oh, I'm I'm not over that. But I'm over that as much as I'm going to need to be to keep going. <laughs> Because then it's just committing to yourself and understanding that there will be blip periods. There will be periods where it's like, oh, the road is gravel. I have to drive a little slower. Yeah. But now I know how. And that's, uh, I think people get really, to me, that's where I see addiction kind of um, cloud most people. Is that addiction? so weird. Well, yeah, but it comes like, you know, it's the block to like being able to handle trauma without anything. Hmm. Mm. You know, because that's been my biggest fear with like this. And I will say I use substance like to fall asleep, but 
I also have never really known a life without my sleep cycle being invaded by something that's particularly evil. So I allow that for myself. But as I allow myself to feel pain and all these things, it's like, I need it less and less. Hmm. And that is the fear that drives me to not sleep is that it's like, really? I really don't need this anymore. I've really changed. I've really changed. And like, yeah. Is There's a death in there. When you've changed, you, a part of you has died. And you have to grieve that. Oh, my God. You're throwing it all the way back. Yeah. Yes. You're like, like hitting the nail yes. on the head. Yeah. We've talked about yes. this yeah. like so much. That this is great. You have to keep killing old parts to re-meet yourself again to create the space for the new. And you, you It's grief. It's just oh, like yeah. all those, sta- those stages of grief where you get, you get uh, like, I know. I, mm. it's It sucks. Lots of it's, old versions were very comfortable, and they yeah. seemed fine and happy. We were having fun. Can I read you guys a poem that I wrote? I would love for you to Fuck do that. Yeah. Just because... Please do. I, uh, we're like literally, we're like quoting it basically. Um, so when I was, and this isn't really what the poem is about specifically, but uh, my, since I was dead as a kid, that's how I think about it now. and never really could fully grasp my aliveness unless I was escaping into music or something else or dance. Um, I always was waiting to have, be able to have the emotional release of somebody else dying or Mm. leaving me. Couldn't wait for it. So then I could finally emote safely about how I felt. (laughs) Um, Wow. Yeah, which is pretty dark now that I've said it out loud on into the mic. It's very real. (laughs) It's very real. real. And like, I remember like specific cartoons, like being alone in my kitchen on a Saturday morning, nobody else is awake and being like, oh wow, that must be what it feels like to feel heartbreak. I can't wait until I have a real, a valid experience where I'm allowed to feel that. Cause that was the whole thing. It's like my pain was invisible even to me. So I didn't understand why I was feeling so swollen with like these tender things. Um, Damn. yeah, it was a lot. Um, and it kept going. My great grandfather who like, who knows their great grandparents really, but I had a pretty rich relationship with them. I was the first great grandchild. There are a lot of things that are pinnacle for me in that life, like weird absolutes, despite this absolute death feeling that I've held, you know, so I've been really lucky in a lot of ways. Um, but my grandfather died when I was 13. That was devastating for me because I could finally emote on that level. So, you know, it just allowed me to emote about my abuse but without knowing that that's what I was doing. So once he died, and then my grandmother died, and then a year after that, my first boyfriend offed himself. And it it was, so I've never been free of facing death in myself, in others. um, And this was like talking about an ex, but it was also talking about the person that abused me. It was talking about, whatever the you is that isn't you. And I said, today isn't about you for once and for always because it's always been about me anyway. A shade of myself reflected in refracting light or darkness in another. It's always been all about me because I lived learning my love as another's consentless. Taking it back is a slow, unpredictable peeling of skin. I don't know how many layers or how thick I just keep shedding. It can be terrifying to have your past peeling away raining on and all around you. One should acquaint themselves with death again and again to truly live. This I really, actually, lovingly believe. And it's like that line for me is like, I think that's one of the only things that I believe that like in in order for me to live, I've had to confront death over and over again. Death is the constant here. Mm. That's the constant for everything. For everything. Mm. Right. (laughs) That's being alive is knowing that death exists, Mm -hmm. that you, that you're so luckily here and it's happening all the time. Mm-hmm. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, Thanks for, thank you. Thanks for holding the space. I'm going to be honest with you. My bladder is going to explode. That's all right. I, I think we're, we're, we're good. You want to call? We're good. Yeah, unless you have any other things you want to hit. Yeah, we all no, got to pee. This is perfect. <laughs> thank you. Can you read that last line again? Yeah, sure. You want to shout out your Instagram or anything? Sings her way up. Um, I'm going to put it in the Yeah, I have things. There will be things. I'm doing work. Mine Swift under dash. Can I ask your last name? Can I put your last name? <laughs> yeah, in there? Uh, Victoria Swift Rutledge is my full name. Okay. Mm. Victoria Swift on in, uh, Facebook. Victoria Swift Rutledge on Instagram. And your what was the three yoga studios? Um, Lark Street Yoga, 
Heart Space in Albany and Elevate 518. Cool. Yeah. I teach Tuesday through Saturday. Great. Mm. Yeah. Do you have any shows coming up? I'm playing at some sort of tavern in a mountain town this weekend. Yeah. I can't well, this isn't going to yeah. go out before then. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, oh, 1122. 1122 is November 22nd. I'm going to be at the Parish Public House with a band. We talked about 22s. Yeah. Two's my favorite number. Exactly, dude. All the connections. Um, mm-hmm. And Victoria was born on a four, which is 22. I mean, two plus two is four. That's true. Uh, but, um, Today's the 22nd. Yes, exactly. That's why I agreed to do this today. Who are you That's playing right. with? Who are you playing with? I um, the C, the C, and Anna Vogelzang. And Anna Vogelzang is on tour, oh, right. and, and she'll be really good. This is the 22nd. I'm so mm-hmm. excited. And where is it? Um, Parish Public House, what used to be I'll Red be there. Square. And I'll be with a band, so it'll be very exciting. First time in I'll be there too. many years. <laughs> I'll see you there. <laughs> yeah. We can talk again. Oh my gosh, I would love that. <laughs> Talking. Maybe we'll all flex a little. Or, um, okay, wait. One more time, I guess, right? Yeah. One should acquaint themselves with death again and again to truly live. This I really, actually, lovingly believe. 